In part A of the question, we have to calculate the linear charge density of the rod. By definition, the linear charge density symbolized by lambda is equal to the total charge on the rod divided by the length of the rod. We can fill in the known values here. The charge was given as negative 4.23 femtocoulombs. Femtocoulombs is times 10 to the negative 15 coulombs. So make sure you make that conversion. And then divided by the length of the rod, which is 8.15, it's given in centimeters. So multiply that by 10 to the negative two to convert it into meters. And when you punch this into your calculator, you should get negative 5.19 times 10 to the negative 14. And then the units will be coulombs per meter, as you can see from the calculational setup. So this is the answer to part A. In part B, we need to figure out the magnitude of the electric field at point P. So let's take a closer look at the picture. We've taken the rod and we have called the leftmost end at a location of zero, so basically an origin. The entire length of the rod from here to here is L, and that makes this coordinate L along that x-axis that we've drawn. Point P is going to be at a coordinate of L plus A, and the reason for that is because the question said the distance from the rightmost end of the rod to point P is lowercase a. And so if we take L and then add it to A, then we would be at point P, indicated as L plus A. And then we have highlighted a differential element along the rod. A differential element is basically a teeny tiny length of the rod, and that teeny tiny length of the rod contains some charge. Basically, we can consider it to be a point charge in essence. And so we know that because it's a teeny tiny length that the amount of charge there would be dq. And then to figure out an expression for dq, we take the linear charge density, which is measured in coulombs per meter, and then we multiply it by the length of that differential element. And that length, again, is very tiny. It's just dx, which is measured in meters. Notice when you multiply coulombs per meter times meters, the meters would cancel, leaving you with coulombs, which is the exact unit of charge. So that sort of is a little internal checkpoint. Now, because we're treating this as a very tiny element of charge, we can basically use the point charge electric field equation. So recall that the point charge electric field equation is E is equal to K times the charge over a distance squared. For our little differential element, we'll just use an adjusted notation. We'll say dE, to represent the electric field produced by that differential element of charge, is equal to K times dQ, which is the tiny amount of charge on that little segment along the rod, divided by the distance squared. Now, we have to come up with a careful expression for the distance. We know that from here all the way out to point P was the L plus A. We also know that the distance from the origin to this differential charge element was x. The distance that we seek is from the differential charge element all the way out to point p. So that would be sort of our question mark there. Hopefully you can see by the arrows that we would simply take l plus a and subtract off that distance right there, x, and that would give us the distance from the differential charge element to point p. So in other words, the distance from the differential charge element to point p is going to be the l plus a and then minus x. And then don't forget to square it. Now what we will do is substitute for dq here this expression right here, the lambda dx that we developed earlier. So now we have a nice expression for the electric field produced by that differential charge element. Notice, by the way, that Because the rod is negatively charged, this little differential element also would be negatively charged. And we probably recall that electric fields point towards negative charge. So in other words, at location indicated by point P, the electric field would be pointing to the left. And so that's going to help us with part C when we predict the direction. Right now we're focused only on magnitude though. So we're good to go with this expression. But this only gives us the expression for that single little differential element of charge, we need the entire electric field across the whole rod. So luckily calculus comes to the rescue and to get the total electric field, you simply integrate the equation that you had developed. So when you integrate DE, you're just gonna end up with the electric field magnitude. When you integrate the other side, you're gonna have to do it with bounds. Well, go back to the picture and you can see that the rod, which is the source of the entire electric field was bounded on the left side by zero and on the right side by L. So your bounds will be from zero to L. Now we know that K and Lambda are both constants. So it might be convenient to factor those to the outside of the integral. That's going to leave you with 
one over this L plus A minus X squared, and then we can put the DX right here. Now to integrate this, you probably would need to do a U substitution. Our variable here is X. So what we'll do is we'll let U equal the quantity L plus A minus X. Remember again, L and A are constants. So when you do the derivative here, DU DX, they both go to zero. The derivative of minus X is just a negative one. We can multiply both sides of the equation by dx, so we can see du is equal to negative dx, and then divide both sides by negative one, so that negative du is equal to dx. So now we can go back and make our substitutions. We will focus on just the integral right now. We'll forget the bounds and the constant that we had factored out. So we would have the integral of one over our u squared, and then dx is negative du. So you can actually factor out a negative one there and then put the du here. So we need to integrate this, and the best way to do that is to rewrite it as u to the negative two. And then we just do a basic power rule. So we're gonna add one to the exponent to make it u to the negative one, and then divide by that new exponent of negative one. These negatives cancel. We're left with u to the negative one, which is one over u, and then we can put our u back in. So remember, it was one over our u, which is L plus A minus X. The bounds here were from zero to L, and we still had that constant that we had factored out. Don't forget about the K lambda. So if you wish, you can put the K lambda in the numerator here, because you're basically multiplying it by K lambda. So now we'll fill in the upper bound first. We'll have the K lambda over, and the upper bound goes in for the X, because X is our variable, so L plus A minus L. And then we'll subtract what we get by plugging in the lower bound, the zero is gonna go in for X, so that'll actually just leave you with L plus A. If you wish, you can actually simplify this, right? Because L minus L is zero. You can also factor out the K lambda, since it's constant and present in both terms. So you have K lambda times one over A minus one over L plus A. There is the electric field equation. And why don't we plug in the known values now? So all of the known values have been plugged in. We've omitted the units for clarity. Just be careful, because A was probably given in centimeters. I think it was 12 centimeters. So we converted that into meters by just moving the decimal over two places to the left. Same thing with the L. Don't forget to convert that into meters. So when you punch this in, you will get a total electric field at point P of about 1.57 times 10 to the minus three. And that should come out as newtons per meter because it is an electric field. So that's the correct answer to part B. It is the magnitude of the electric field. We can come back up here and they want the direction. Now we already indicated that that negative charge on that differential element would produce an electric field that points to the left. And so all of these differential elements are negative. They're all gonna create little electric fields that point to the left. So when you add these all up by integrating, as we just did, then you end up with a total electric field that points to the left. So the the answer would be sort of to the left. Uh, if your homework system wants an angle, it might be represented as 180 degrees from the positive x-axis. That would be another way of expressing the direction. So here's your positive x-axis. If you go 180 degrees, then you'd be pointing you know, that way to the left. So either way should be fine. We go on to part D, and part D wants the electric field magnitude produced at distance A equals 50 meters. Well, that shouldn't be too bad actually because we did all this hard work to get the expression for the electric field in terms of all of our variables. So really what we're gonna do for part D is just use that same equation, but for lowercase a, we'll actually plug in 50 meters. So let's go ahead and do that. So there we have plugged in the known values. Again, notice we changed the lowercase a to 50 meters. When you punch this in, you should get about 1.52 times 10 to the negative eighth newtons per coulomb. So this would be the correct answer for the magnitude of the electric field when a is equal to 50 meters. Finally, we go back to part e, and it says a particle of charge negative 4.23 femtocoulombs then replaces the rod. And so this would be the picture. There's an interesting result here. If we 
Remember, the electric field produced by just a point charge would just be k times the magnitude of that charge divided by the distance squared. So we would just plug in the value for k, multiply that by the charge, the magnitude of the charge, that would be positive 4.23 times 10 to the negative 15 coulombs. Don't forget to convert the femtocoulombs into coulombs. And then divided by the distance, which is 50 meters squared. Now when you punch this in, you're gonna get the exact, almost the exact same answer as the answer we got in part D. So it's about 1.52 times 10 to the negative eight newtons per coulomb. And so I think what they're saying here is that when you have a rod versus a little point charge here, and you are determining the electric field at a distance that is very, very large compared to the length of the rod. Remember, the length of the rod was something like eight and a half centimeters, but the distance at which we're calculating the electric field right now is 50 meters. So that distance is very, very, very big compared to the length of the rod. So as that happens, as the electric field distance increases, we can more and more treat the rod as just a point charge. It's basically almost like the negative charges along the rod are concentrating themselves into just a single point charge. So it's not surprising that the answers to D and E would be roughly the same.